Uh, hello, uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm happy to welcome you uh, for the seventh annual conference for the doctoral program in social science uh, and the doctoral program in political, societal and regional change. I'm Özlem Çelik, uh, I'll be your host during the event and I'm a postdoc researcher at HELSUS and Global Development Studies discipline here in Helsinki University. I'm a human geographer working on the political economy of urban development and change, including the politics of urban economic relations, housing, state interventions and urban social movements. And I also have a particular interest in qualitative research methods and design. And so the idea of this workshop appeared in one of our Exalt conference organization meeting as a part of bringing the possible methodological challenges that researchers face. And we, as a team at different stages of their academic career, including two of our PhD students, Sofia Hagalone Albo and Theodora Harvey, and also the professor Anya Nibre and me, developed this idea for the workshop for the last couple of months. So this workshop aims to open a discussion on the topic of carrying out research in increasingly uncertain and sometimes even volatile conditions and explore some of the methodological transformations and uh, transformations we as researchers may undertake to meet these challenges. So the workshop will open with a panel discussion led by three panelists who will introduce some of the key challenges in social science methodologies based on their own experiences with data collection and analysis. After the panel presentations, we will have 10 minutes for a question and a answers, uh, answers part. And then the audience will go to one of the three workshops, including microscale quantitative analysis, text-driven documentary analysis, and ethnographic approaches. And our panelists will act as the facilitators in each room. So after your discussions in your selected group, we will come back together and our PhD representatives in each group will report back the discussions and each will have five minutes to do that. And then we will close the workshop. So I hope you will all enjoy the talks and the breakout room discussions. So before we go into the breakout rooms, I would like to invite our three speakers to give their talks. So each speaker have 10 minutes and I will kindly ask you to wrap up if you're going beyond the given time. So all of our speakers are based in the University of Helsinki. And our first speaker will be Anne Kovanen, who is a professor in social policy and also a lecturer in social epidemiology in the Center for Public Health, Queen's University of Belfast. Anne's research focuses on the social determinants of health. Her research involves the application of social epidemiological methods and administrative record linkage, as well as large scale prospective survey designs and RCTs. And she will be with you in the Microscale Quantitative Analysis Group. The second speaker will be Thomas Yulentela. Uh, he's an associate professor in political science and Thomas' research looks at climate change policy making and politics in a comparative perspective. He is particularly interested in the role of policy networks and media discourse networks in the making of climate change policy. And Thomas will be with you in the text-driven documentary analysis group. And our last speaker will be Anni Kayanus, who is an assistant professor in social and cultural anthropology. And Anni is a specialist in the anthropology of China. Her research focuses on culture and cognition, morality, cooperation, competition and conflict, migration, education, gender and family. And she will be with you in the ethnographic approaches group. And uh, so the, our, I will invite the first speaker, Anne, uh, who is going to talk about the challenges of pragmatic RCT data collection during the COVID-19 pandemic. The floor is yours, Anne. Okay, thank you very much. I think the slides are there, are they? The slides will be up in 30 seconds. Okay, brilliant. So I'll, I'll kick off anyway. So um, it's my pleasure to give you this, this talk. It's very of, um, topical uh, how, how this pandemic has affected data collection. And I'm going to talk about um, a connect context of pragmatic randomized control trial RCT uh, um, data collection. Okay, the next slide. So this is uh, our protocol, which was published late last year. 
can skip for the next one. So the Academy of Finland granted this project a short-term funding for two years. So I applied for a four-year project, but they gave me two years. And the aim of this funding was to support particularly uh, innovative, uh, high-quality projects, which have been identified as containing risks. Um, uh, and little we knew that the, these risks uh, during this time would be quite considerable at the, at the end. Uh, so the, this intervention, I'll very briefly present it, what, what it contains, but it's about depression and sickness absence in, um, in young employees. Okay, the next one. And here are the co-authors of the, of the study. Okay, next. So pragmatic trial is a um, RCT, which is designed to evaluate the effectiveness of intervention in real life uh, context in, uh, in the context of healthcare research in routine practice. So um, it aims to maximize the applicability and generalizability of the results because we are looking at if the intervention works in real life conditions. Okay, next please. And in this hour trial, we are aiming to test the effectiveness of an internet delivered ICBT, um, uh, cognitive behavioral uh, therapy program, mental hub for depression, which was um, developed by HUS, Helsinki University Hospital. And we are testing its effectiveness of reducing sickness absence in young employees. The next. Uh, so all participants are recruited within Occupational Health Helsinki, which is occupational health service provider for the city of Helsinki employees. And the city of Helsinki is the largest employer in, in Finland with about 40,000 employees annually. And uh, so this is a, a pragmatic trial, as I explained. So there are no constraints on care as usual. So they can, they can, uh, their, the participants assigned into a control group will, will have the care what they would have normally otherwise had. The next. And the recruitment and the protocol. It, um, it is that psychiatric and occupational health nurses, so there is about 40 of them in the Occupational Health Helsinki, they will um, uh, recruit the participants and uh, they are nurses in occupational health system are the first point of call when the employee experiences mental health problems. Uh, we train the nurses to, to do this recruitment and started the recruitment in October 2019. And uh, we have very strict you know, ethical procedures. I will not go into them more in detail, uh, but basically the nurse will, when they meet the client uh, who meets the inclusion criteria, they will tell the patient about the study and provide them with general information, participant information sheet, and then the um, potential participants can have a think about participation and in the next, next visit, they can, they can sign up. Okay, the next one. And uh, then if the participant signs the consent for, form, uh, uh, the nurse will assign them a randomization envelope to our research assistant had prepared following the randomization uh, protocol. And then the participant and the nurse will discover whether the participant is in a treatment group or a control group. And then they, if they are in the treatment group, they can get a referral to an ICPT program. The next. And our outcome is the sickness absence. And this comes from, uh, from the records. Um, from Kela, uh, sickness absence records plus the employees, uh, employee sickness absence, uh, the shorter uh, sickness absence periods from the from the employer's records. Okay, the next and and the treatment is uh, one uh, 
160 minutes ICPT session per week for um, uh, normally seven weeks. And they can access the um, program or the software outside working hours. The next. And the care, as you saw, is the any routine care the employees may receive when they are presenting with depressive symptoms. And this, there are listed in different types of um, types of uh, care they can get. Most typical uh, antidepressant prescription and sick note. Uh, but all participants have access to usual care. Next. And here is the our ethics. We have very strict protocol study was approved by the HUS uh, Helsinki University Hospital Ethics Board. And now next one, I'm moving on to the actual, the problems we've been having. So the recruitment started in October, 2019. So it's just a year ago now. And um, it was initially very slow. And our postdoc had meetings with participating nurses. And then it appeared that the psychiatric nurses who are the ones who most likely will be seeing the patients with depressive symptoms were not um, trained about the intervention. And they have been actually told that they are not part of the recru recruitment at all. So we rectified this quite quickly and trained them. The nurses seemed committed at that point, but they said that the extra workload is a problem. It takes time to go through go through the intervention with the patient and um, and it's it's difficult when they when they their their patients are are depressed depressed and uh, there is lots to discuss in a short period of time uh, they were getting nurses were getting several reminders from the chief physician and the head nurse they're like bosses they like really like five to ten reminders every week almost. And then we also introduce incentives, lunch vouchers. So, so far, so good. But just when we are about to get everything started, going well, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic struck, struck and the participant recruitment came uh, to a halt because all mental health consultations went online. And the nurses have been working from home since then, and they have not had an access to randomized um, re recruitment envelopes, which are in their office buildings. And of course, they couldn't avail of incentives either. But the, this um, envelopes are a bigger, bigger problem. The next one. Uh, it would not be ethically possible for nurses to uh, store these envelopes at home because they contain the participants. ID number. Uh, we cannot redo the randomization. Let's go back <laughs> one, one slide back. Thank you. Uh, because a um, number of participants were already enrolled. So we cannot like run the randomization again and do it somehow like electronically that we wouldn't have any envelopes there. Uh, so the recruitment phase is going to take longer than we originally anticipated. We anticipated 18 months and the target N, which was very um, ambitious, around 500, will not be reached. That we are like, much sure now at this point. The next one. So then the solutions. Uh, we have like a few, um, we have a bit of a backup plan here. So first is to extend the recruitment period. So I've applied funding from the academy for this. Um, the second, which we have already implemented that if remote consultations continue, but if the nurses return to office, because some of them have now returned to the office, patients are at home, consent forms can be uh, returned by email using their work email addresses. So nurses have been informed about this, uh, but they are still telling us that the workload is very high and um, the situation is ex um, escalated there in terms of the mental health consultations to due to the worries employees have over the 
over the corona virus related issues. Uh, so the, then the next thing we can do, if, if we get a really, really small sample, we can consider using um, exact statistics for statistical testing. This can be used to produce more reliable estimates when analyzing, analyzing very small data sets. There are some examples in the, in the literature for that. The next one. However, if the final sample turns out to be too, too small uh, for any kind of meaningful statistical analysis, we can still um, conduct research from implementation science perspective. And this alternative study would pay to qualitatively investigate the use of strategies, strategies applied to integrate a mental health, inter health intervention within this organization, Occupational Health Helsinki. And again, there are, there are examples um, in the literature for, for how, to, how to do that. So these are kind of the options we, we are left, left with. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Anne. Thanks a lot. It was uh, very interesting to see how one of the research affected by COVID, actually. So that thank you for sharing the insights of your research. Uh, and Thomas, can we continue with you? Yes, sure. Um, okay. Uh, so my research actually personally has not been affected that much by the pandemic. Um, so I'll, I'm taking a bit of a different approach here uh, and, and, and I'll say a few words about things that I've, things that I've heard about from other people's research, mostly. A little something about uh, a survey that we'll be doing, uh, we'll be doing with my team next month. Uh, so overall, I, I would just say, you know, I've heard of both positive and, and negative impacts on, on data collection of the pandemic. Uh, an obvious example of a negative effect is a friend of mine who was going to go to Kaliman, Kalimantan in Indonesia for his postdoc fieldwork, but couldn't go because he couldn't risk getting the virus here in Finland or more likely getting it in Jakarta on his way and taking it to these villages where people certainly don't have access to respirators or intensive care units or, or anything of that sort. So, so it became a research ethical question of very different sort, uh, I guess, from, um, from those. Uh, yeah, it, it was an important, important research ethical question. There was no, no way to, to do that field work. So he came up with a workaround of doing online ethnography um, and he has luckily been always half an adventurous anthropologist and half a computer nerd so he he actually managed he is managing it quite well uh, but he had to change his research questions quite a bit he had to change his his, his approach quite a bit and, and and he's saying it's certainly slightly less exciting than hanging out in Indonesia but but he's managing um, um, but apart and, and apart from ethnography, it's of course uh, easy to imagine other data collection methods that are difficult or or slightly questionable now, such as putting people in in small rooms with eight eight other other people to do a focus group interview uh, might also pose a risk for some people. Let alone if you were to interview people who belong to risk the so-called risk groups of, of this virus. Um, so, so there's a lot that, that gets on the way. Um, um, we've been doing, doing mostly Twitter data collection and text, uh, sort of media text data collection this year. Luckily, that was, it was planned that way. So, so and there we didn't, we haven't encountered too many issues. Uh, we are planning to field a smallish elite survey um, next month. Uh, we are originally considering in the spring, but we didn't have to do it in the spring. So we, we said fall is better. Um, and, uh, and 
we'll see how it goes. I'm I'm pretty confident that'll be fine because I, you know, on the other hand, there's these obvious negative impacts and, and challenges. But on the other hand, I've I've also heard stories from last spring where people have been saying it's been actually much easier to get interviews with people in the spring because everyone was just you know sitting at home and apparently they were having more time to do things. So I don't, for some reason I didn't feel that way at all. Maybe it was partly because I had two kids home from the kindergarten and you know was taking care of them half days and trying to trying to put in a full day of work in the other half day. But but apparently you know you hear these stories where like ingredients for slow food have sales have gone up because people have time to cook and the last one I heard just a couple of days was that a couple of days ago was that um, the sales of musical instruments in Finland had gone up significantly so people have more time to stay home and play music and whatever so I'm I'm kind of guessing or I'm hoping they might also have a little bit more time at work uh, because some projects get cancelled and they don't have to commute to work whatever I, I, I've also heard these kind of stories um, and 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 so I'm hoping I, I'm hoping people will also have time to take our little survey for for 15 or 20 minutes um, even though so this is like so so who so we're surveying the policy elite on on climate change um, politics so organizational representatives uh, and and we ask them about their collaboration networks and their their positions in in climate change uh, politics um, and but but for us response rates are super important because we're doing network analysis so for other survey research it's important but for network surveys it's very very important to be able to capture most of the network actually so so but finland luckily is a relatively easy country for doing for doing these kind of things um so i'm i'm pretty sure it it'll go okay. Um, I'm observing there might also be some other advantages like like an, another example is one of my MA students who is interviewing municipal civil servants in Finland and so she can do her interviews on Zoom instead of traveling all around Finland and and you know record them directly on Zoom uh, and of course, in principle, she could have done it on Zoom before the pandemic, uh, but I don't think the kind of people that she wants to interview were used to using tools like this before the pandemic. I don't think they would have, you know, if she approached them and said, oh, I want to do an interview on this thing called Zoom, they'd be like, oh, what's that? I have no idea. I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, but now everyone's more or less used to this. So I think, you know, she'll be fine. And, and she'll save a lot of travel time and, and a lot of and a little bit of travel money um, and, and, and get good recordings, uh, I think. And of course, all, all this also applies, you know, to traveling, uh, traveling around the world, which is quite something. I mean, now you could quite easily imagine that you would do interview research on Zoom to interview 30 people from different continents. Uh, and not have any travel budget or not have you know not have to worry about your carbon footprint flying around the globe doing these interviews it's because you know everyone's used to zoom why wouldn't they do an interview so I, you know it, it might even be that in in the long term uh this this people getting used to doing things remotely may be actually useful for some kinds of some kinds of data collection plus of course you get automatically you get also uh video recording of the interview in case you're interested in the kind of analysis where you look at kind of micro interactions and you seeing people's people's faces and, and reactions to to your um, to your comments is important. Uh, yeah, so that's just a few potential or or actual positive negatives and positives that that came to my mind uh, on, under the current circumstances I'll finish here thanks thanks a lot thomas thank you so you opened up two new things for us is one is the new cat categories of research methods i think is going to be uh in the discussion and normalization of doing research via online channels which we weren't used to uh, so thank you very much for your
talk. Uh, before we move to Anni, I'll just remind uh, the participants that if you have questions, you can use the chat box and uh, or you can raise your hands. So Anni. Thank you very much. Um, so my name is Anni Gajanus and I teach here at the Social and Cultural Anthropology. And I'll be talking about the challenges to ethnographic methodology uh, that the pandemic has posed. And uh, uh, I haven't, uh, during the pandemic, I didn't have plans to carry out uh, ethnographic research personally. So I'll talk a bit uh, about these challenges on a general level and about some of the conversations that we are having at the moment within the discipline and some of the practical uh, ap uh, adaptations and also maybe the potential uh, kind of positive uh, potential that these circumstances have, even though I have to stress that there's nothing positive about these circumstances. But uh, so ethnographic uh, research it involves these varying degrees of immersion into the social worlds of the participants. So even though this degree varies, it's always, always depends on this uh, trust-based, long uh, sustained uh, working relationships uh, that the researcher builds with the participants and uh, uh, through the sustained uh, interactions. And uh, the key words here are sustained and in-person interactions. So this already makes it very obvious to everybody uh, how the pandemic uh, is particularly challenging to those disciplines that are using uh, relying on ethnographic methodology. And uh, uh, of course, all over the world in anthropology departments, this is the only thing that people are now talking about. And uh, uh, one piece that I found quite useful that summarizes the key challenges uh, to ethnographic research uh, was written by this group of um, professors at Yale, uh, some of them anthropologists, and then a few other disciplines uh, that also rely on ethnographic methodologies. And it's published on the, um, uh, in the items uh, sort of blog site for the uh, SSRC website and maybe I can provide the link after. Uh, but I think it's a very nice summary of these uh, key challenges. And the first one is that there remains this profound uncertainty uh, about both the epidemi epidemiology uh, of the pandemic and its social, economic and political consequences. And we are having to face these challenges uh, under this overarching uncertainty. And the second main challenge is that ethnographic uh, research often involves groups of people uh, that are highly vulnerable. So for example, migrant populations, workers in the informal economies, uh, undocumented uh, communities uh, all across the world. And uh, what we have to understand is that uh, the, the kind of turmoil and the long-term, uh, short-term and long-term consequences uh, that the, uh, of this pandemic uh, will keep unfolding in relation to these communities and increasing their vulnerability. And this needs to be taken into account uh, in our, uh, it might uh, push us to, or just require like significantly, uh, us to significantly adjust uh, our research methodologies, theoretical approaches, methodological approaches and logistics. Uh, then the obvious one, uh, the third challenge is the obvious one that the ethnographic uh, fieldwork is based on social interactions. And uh, at the time when the main protection against uh, this epidemic is social distancing, uh, the, it's, the added challenge here is that because we work uh, across the world that these practices and norms of social distancing and social interaction will vary greatly. Uh, between different locations. And uh, that brings up the, uh, the fourth point, the final point, which is um, mostly ethical, uh, that it's, uh, it, it is highly challenging to make these ethical judgments about uh, what kind of regulations uh, local, uh, both local, international, and also uh, the regulations of the sending country or the uh, home country of the researcher uh, what kind of regulations are sufficiently protecting both the researcher and the co local communities that we work with? And uh, this will be challenging uh, both to individual researchers, but also to the ethical review boards. And uh, uh, ethnographic methodology is essentially ex uh, explorative methodology. And uh, 
what's inherent to it is that uh, there's no one model that will fit every situation. And, and these challenges, uh, the four challenges that I uh, just listed, uh, will need to be built into the research design, redesign uh, and execution uh, under this overarching uncertainty that all of us living. And uh, most likely we will be one of the last ones, uh, the disciplines relying on ethnographic methodologies will be one of the last ones to resume, if, if they ever will, uh, their previous sort of rhythms and patterns of data collection. So, um, how many minutes I have left? Uh, five? Okay, good. Uh, so, okay, so then, one, one thing that is uh, quite essential uh, or is quite significant, especially to anthropologists, is that uh, entire research careers are built on this first ethnographic research uh, that often is carried out during the uh, uh, doctoral studies and usually it takes 12 to 16 months. And then uh, anything that happens after that, uh, will, uh, that will work as a base uh, for the research career of the individual. So this is creating a situation that, uh, uh, where we are pushed to maybe rethink this model slightly. And it's also blowing some new air into these conversations about decolonizing the ethnographic methodologies. So rethinking, rethinking collaboration in two levels, uh, both the local collaborations that we have and the collaborations between colleagues. And the local collaborations that we have, uh, anthropologists or ethnographers have traditionally worked alone a lot, maybe relying on some uh, small scale research assistant locally. But maybe this is an uh, opportunity for us to start rethinking more substantial collaborations with local research institutions and so on. And then between colleagues, um, any, uh, for example, anthropology department will have years and years of uh, ethnographic expertise, uh, but it will be identified kind of uh, uh, it will be uh, on individual researchers, so they are in possession of their data and uh, the data is very rarely shared. So um, maybe this is also pushing us to rethink uh, models for data sharing and that will again push us to think about systematizing and uh, questions of systematizing ethnographic data, archiving it, um, maybe making it uh, accessible and so on. And that brings up a lot of questions about intellectual property rights uh, and various other ethical, uh, ethical things. And, uh, and then finally, uh, just to wrap up, I also want to mention that uh, a few of these things that we are uh, hacks or uh, workarounds that uh, people are using at the moment, but these, I have to note that these do, uh, these sort of remote uh, methodologies, they do favor first elite populations, so research on elite populations, and then second, uh, research projects that are already underway because they will be building on. Uh, so that's, for example, the situation for me, uh, because I have about three years of uh, sustained ethnographic research in China that I have carried out. So now I'm able to collaborate, for example, with some of these uh, commercial ethnographic consulting uh, research institutions uh, who are able to collect data, for example, ask participants to record video diaries, uh, use these uh, online platforms for qualitative research. One of them is called Together, where uh, through it you, are, you can send uh, prompts to people's smartphones to uh, answer some questions or record something. Uh, depending on your research topic, about their dream, about an important uh, place for them uh, in their life and various things. And I've, for example, been involved uh, in, a, in a research project about people's, people experiencing the COVID uh, in Wuhan, uh, in China, where it started. And uh, uh, just to uh, finish, to say that because, it, so because of this, uh, the pandemic is uh, particularly challenging for researchers relying on ethnographic method. But one advantage with, that we do have is that it is an uh, explore, explorative method. And uh, we are already accustomed to turning our attention to what is possible and also what is interesting in these new circumstances. So not all of us will be able to uh, turn our focus to the human-non-human entanglements around the COVID 
uh, pandemic, but we are doing our best to adapt our research topics and methodologies to the circumstances. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. It was a it was a very interesting actually uh, talk as well uh, to understand what how is it going to affect it uh, affect the ethnographic studies because I, I also agree that it is going to be affected the most probably. Um, we have ten minutes for questions and answers, so you can raise your hand or use the chat box. But in the meantime, to warm up, I will ask some questions because we don't have questions now. So, uh, so maybe you can think of other questions while I'm asking mine. Uh, the um, the first one is: Do you think digitalization will play a huge role uh, in your research? So, in, in three different parts of your research, and uh, and the second one is. Uh, looks like we all have to gain new skills to do research and do you think how it is going to affect the whole research environment, especially people who just started or people already got loads of skills in certain research methods, so how it is going to be affected. Something in the chat box I'm checking? No, okay, so that's from money. If there are no other questions, we can start. Thomas? Sure, yeah. Um, well, digitalization obviously has huge effects on people studying social networks, uh, like myself. Uh, there are sort of traditional methods, like, like some of the ones we're using, just doing surveys and asking people who they collaborate with. Uh, but increasingly, we are using Twitter data, which I think I mentioned which produces, it's just a platform that produces, naturally produces social networks, retweet networks and mention networks. And, and it's quite easy, easy if you know how to do it. <laughs> it's, an, it it's an easy uh, data source. And also some of the methods of coding more traditional media material, um, computer assisted coding are getting better, even though even though they're not quite there yet, we are still doing manual coding, um, coding of media material in my team. But this Twitter stuff is quite interesting. And the thing about it is, of course, that you do have to learn new skills or you have to pe have to hire people who already have these skills. So I've hired people from the US, people from Japan, people from Ireland who, with specific calls for social scientists who would know how to know how to do some coding uh, and and you know if you have people like that or if you can train to do yourself to do something like that you there there's a wealth of data out there of course and 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 then that that you can then analyze with i mean with the stuff that i know how to do i can analyze it once someone someone knows how to get it for me Thank you. Um, Anne, would you like to comment or? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm thinking that that's uh, for kind of research I'm doing. So I do very different uh, types of research. So this was just one snapshot, this RCT. So we have long been using administ administrative data from registers, like, which I consider as big data. So there are, for example, um, all these Helsinki City Council workers, uh, antidepressant prescriptions from 1995 or something like that. So for every day that if they, if they purchase this uh, prescription, this medication or that, or their sick, sickness absence records for years and years for, for each day. So I, I think this is, this has been for, for this particular project, uh, very helpful that we had a work package using just this register data where we did a kind of quasi experimental trial using just register data. So it's kind of an, uh, salvaging this, this the whole, whole project that we had that part. So this admin data has uh, turned out to be extremely valuable. Then from the other, uh, and of the more like subject specific uh, point of view that I have um, a strategic research council project on 
on uh, uh, digital exclusion and then marginalization and that's become really really topical, topical now and our work package looks at migrants and we collect quite a lot of qualitative data in in that i have researchers who are experts in, in qualitative data collection. We do also also a survey data collection. And this has been impacted a lot. And then because of the nature of the topic is digital exclusion, we can't do Zoom interviews because we are trying to approach, approach let's say, an older migrants. Many of them can't read, they cannot speak uh, Finnish or it's, it's very uh, challenging and, and uh, um, kind of face-to-face -face interviews with interpreters would have been the, the best option, but we are trying to navigate navigate around it. Uh, and this has uh, required some modifications for like ethics applications and, and stuff like that. But we are like more and more doing just uh, phone interviews with interpreters and it's not ideal. But um, it's, it's any way to get these people's voices heard now when it's really, really critical and all the health and um, lots of the health and other services are just going digital and there's no, uh, there are so many of these systems you have to be able to use. So, so I think from them, it's both a methodological and, and subject specific or topic specific question moment for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. But before uh, Anne uh, responds, there is one question specifically asked to Anne, but also to all of you. So I will just want to share it first. Um, and um, so Anne, uh, concerning your last point on asking participants to carry out tasks like video diaries, etc. How do you evaluate the ethics within putting this workload on them? This may also concern the extra workloads reported by nurses in Anne's case or potentially pushing people into video interviews. In your opinion, what are the dangers here with COVID coming in and how can we use the current pandemic to work through uh, ills that have been around all along? Um, so using academic extractivism as a vantage point. Uh, yeah, uh, I can maybe respond first to that. Uh, that's a great question and also it's a great point that this is an issue that has been uh, around all along and now it's just in a different format like if we are asking people to uh, record video diaries uh, it's not uh, essentially that different from uh, when you are in a field and you just ask people to uh, allow you to be there and answer all your questions and uh, let you observe them and provide an extra plate and whatever you are asking them to uh, it's some it it does uh, it is always a burden and uh, and I think this uh, goes case by case. I don't have the like the big answer to this, but uh, in my own experience, uh, I thought thought through it uh, case by case. So, for example, in my own research, uh, I work uh, I've done a lot of research in schools and uh, in relation to children. And even though my research topic is actually has to do with human development rather than things like education or something like that, uh, I've negotiated uh, in conversations both with the local research institutions and the schools and the families, uh, what would they be interested in? What would they like to get from my involvement? And sometimes it's been something like I taught karate uh, and other martial arts to 300 second graders in China for a year. <laughs> and, uh, and sometimes it's something like I write reports to the schools uh, about children's uh, uh, competitive motivations or conflict resolutions and things like that. And th these have actually resulted in uh, kind of practical, uh, they've been, the results have been implemented in the school practices. So I think uh, in any research context, there always have to be, has to be uh, attention paid to this and a conversation about, uh, about this. Uh, it depends on the people you are doing the research with. Uh, what what would they what do they find useful? What do they want from the what what can you give? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Anna and Thomas, would you like to make a point? So I'll give you one minute each, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay. So uh, I also I acknowledge this this point, and I, I found that 
ethics committees are not very happy. I would say especially the, uh, the ethics committee at the University of Helsinki of in issue of incentives. So I have proposed uh, incentives when we have been researching and vulnerable like um, low income people. I have proposed incentives of 20 euros gift vouchers for co supermarket and S market and the uh, ethics committee, they don't approve this. And uh, I, I find it ethically difficult that that we are not able, I would have funding for this and I would have money in my budget, but I can't provide them. And I know that it would make a huge difference for somebody who is on basic income, income support. And it, I think it's ethically wrong not to give them incentives, but that's the case we can't. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, well, I, I was actually just gonna talk about incentives as well, even though I haven't proposed them personally, but I I mean, we're just planning an online experiment um, that, that we'll be doing on Twitter. And, and I've talked to some American colleagues and a lot of them actually do pay people for taking surveys or use the Amazon Mechanical Turk where you, where you pay people like tiny amounts of money uh, to participate in research. And I, I don't know, I have a kind of a difficult relationship with, with that thinking, but apparently, I don't know, I should just probably read a bit more into it and see, see what, I mean, there must be a discussion on how, what kind of effects that has on, on results, but, but it, it definitely is something that is increasingly being used, I think, in, in online uh, research, especially. Thank you very much. I think we have that, yeah, all questions we have is uh, done so far.